Okay, so in our previous video, we looked at the first parts of the bryophyte life cycle. We'll continue our discussion on bryophytes by first entitling this next flowchart, Bryophyte 2. And this is going to be focusing again on the life cycle. And also, I want to round out the bryophytes by looking at the importance of the mosses specifically. Okay, so let's continue that life cycle, that complicated uh, life cycle of these very uh, sort of simple looking plants, but certainly complicated life cycle plants. So life cycle continued. So we left off last time by mentioning that the gametophyte will eventually create a uh, structures that will have fertilization undergo within them. The sperm and the egg will form together to give us a zygote. The zygote will continue to grow via mitosis into a multicellular embryo. Now, what's interesting about the bryophytes is that you can also have a sporophyte growing. A sporophyte is another part of the bryophyte structure. So we have a sporophyte and a gametophyte. But the sporophyte can be within, let's say, the larger gametophyte structure that is a bryophyte. All right, hold on. Let me try to explain that in just a couple of uh, ideas that the sporophyte really helps us understand the idea of sporophyte within gametophyte. All right, so here we go. The sporophyte um, grows out of the archegonium. Okay, that's where its origination is. And the archegonium, as we know, is the site of fertilization. It's where the sperm meets the egg. It's where the growing embryo is housed. And so if we know that, we know that there is the capability of more growth. This is where growth really happens, the archegonium of a bryophyte. And so the sporophyte is where it's going to grow out of. I mean, the sporophyte will grow out of this archegonium for that reason. Okay, We have a lot of uh, capabilities here for growth. The thing is with the sporophyte is that this structure stays relatively small. Okay, It stays pretty much small, and it is nutritionally dependent on the gametophyte. Remember how we first said the fact that the gametophyte is independent of the sporophyte? Opposite is not true. The sporophyte is nutritionally dependent on the gametophyte. So the gametophyte structure of a bryophyte is the larger, more dominant life cycle structure that can provide nutrition for the smaller, less dominant life cycle of a moss. Okay? This is going to be exemplified when we look at the parts, but before we do that, the parts of the sporophyte, I just want to mention something. The sporophyte is initially going to be of a green color, and then that would mean that it, of course, goes undergoes photosynthesis. Photosynthesis usually is tied with this green chlorophyll pigment, right? But later on, actually, throughout maturity, and this is why this is not the, life, the dominant life cycle, uh, once we get to maturity, this sporophyte, once it's fully matured, it actually turns into a brown color and can no longer do photosynthesis. Plus, no photosynthesis. So the maturity, brown, no photosynthesis, initially green plus photosynthesis. So there's a big difference that happens through the development of the sporophyte. Makes sense, right? The sporophyte can't be the dominant stage of the bryophyte if you eventually get to a part where you can't even do photosynthesis. And we're looking at a plant. Don't forget that. This is a plant. And so, of course, photosynthesis has to happen. It can't happen at the sporophyte mature level, let's say. Finally, in terms of the sporophyte, we'll round about the idea with the basic parts of a sporophyte. And this will help us understand really what the purpose of a sporophyte is. So a sporophyte contains a foot structure. And this foot structure is basically going to be what anchors the sporophyte to the gametophyte. Anchors to gametophyte. So the gametophyte is our larger dominant life cycle structure within the bryophyte. The foot is going to be what's going to allow the sporophyte to stay here, sort of connect to the gametophyte and stay connected. And this is going to be an important region. I like to think of this as sort of like the placenta region because this is where the foot is going to have first access and the ability to absorb both water and nutrients from the parent plant. Water plus NUTR for nutrients, so those are key things uh, from the parent plant. And the parent plant in this situation is a gametophyte moss, let's say, a gametophyte bryophyte, whatever it may be, from parent plant. Okay, so the foot is good for this process right over here. Another part to remember is the seta of the sporophyte. The seta is otherwise known as the stalks of the seta, of the uh, entire sporophyte structure. Here, the stalks of the sporophyte are what takes material from the foot to the capsule. And we'll explain in just a second. Takes material, so it's sort of a transport mechanism. Takes material from 
foot. That's what we established right over here, where we get the water and nutrients. That's the material that's being taken from the foot to a structure known as the capsule. And of course, the capsule will now be our next part to look at. What is the capsule of our sporophyte? The capsule is another way of saying the sporangium. This is something we mentioned before. The sporangium is going to be the location of sporanginous cells. AKA, remember, sporophytes are diploid, and sporanginous cells are the diploid cells of a bryophyte. Okay, these are the diploid cells of a bryophyte, but remember, bryophyte is dominantly gametophytic, okay, if that's a word, in its nature. So most of the cells are going to be of that haploid stage, of that haploid gametophyte structure. Here we have a continuous structure of diploid sporanginous cells. And over here, we also are going to have the production, and this is where we have spores being produced. So the sporangium produces spores. Spores are, of course, haploid. So this is via the process of 2N to N. That's going to be meiosis. And that's the first time we mention meiosis explicitly in the life cycles of a bryophyte. So it's a point to remember. The capsule where the sporangium is is where the spores are formed via meiosis in the sporophyte structure. And then finally, the last part to remember is a part known as the peristome. The peristome. And the peristome is just referred to as, basically think of it as the upper capsule. Okay? And this is going to make sense in just a second. Stone means what? Opening, right? So what we have here is a capsule, uh, an opening to this sporangium structure. Specifically, this structure is going to be, uh, it's going to have a ring structure to it. How it looks is like, a, a, very much resembles a ring structure. And so this is actually going to be the place where we open and release. So the peristome opens and releases spores if it's dry. So spores can disperse into the air if the environment calls for it. Remember, we're not completely able to do whatever we want to do on land because we're still sort of uh, a bryophyte. We're still a very old plant. We're still very much reliant on a moist environment. But let's say the environment's dry. We must have a way to continue our life. And this is the backup plan, essentially. This is why this is not the sporophyte stage, let's say, is not the dominant stage. This is simply a backup. If it's dry, if there's not moisture, if there hasn't been rain for so long, bryophytes aren't simply going to die. Certainly their production is going to get less, but what's going to happen is there will be a backup. There will be these spores being created by the sporangium structure that are going to allow for a continuance of life, let's say. And so the peristome, its main purpose is to aid in dispersion. Remember, the key goals of life are survival and reproduction. The sporophyte is a perfect structure for survival and reproduction if cases, if the situation is dire, if it's dry, if it's difficult for this bryophyte, which wants moist environment, which wants a relatively watery environment to succeed, if the situation does not call for it, go for the backup, the sporophyte. This is our transition to land, essentially. This is, what, this is what helped us with the land transition. So the sporophyte is a big, big structure important for the land transition of plants as a whole, specifically the bryophytes. Finally, um, after we establish the life cycle, that's it. Now I just want to round out on something important, and that is the importance of mosses. So the one major gripe every student has whenever we're starting to learn about the plants is, why do I have to learn this? What does this have in terms of relevancy to my life? Well, I'm going to try to give you some relevancy right here. These are, this is the couple, couple of importances uh, of moss, and there are many more than what's going to be listed. But right now, just walk away with this at least. So first of all, um, if the mosses are a very, very, you probably know this already, common part of a moist forest, okay? Um, very common in moist forests. So they're very pervasive if the environment is correct for it. So forest and some wetlands as well. So they're very common there. That means they're probably integral. They're a big part of the entire, let's say, scope of that forest. Remember ecology from biology 116, biology 115? This is the ba basic idea. We have a, a common thing that's throughout the moist forest, right? In addition, the, mo the mosses can colonize, they can grow on, they can succeed in some environments that have, let's say, bare and sandy soil. A lot of plants can't do this. Why? Because a lot of plants have gotten so used to very nice, uh, full and rich soil that they can't grow on bare and sandy soil. 
But what mosses can do is because they have this backup, like this sporified structure, they can grow here. And because they grow here, they are able to retain whatever trace amounts of nitrogen, retain N for nitrogen in the soil. And if they're retaining nitrogen in the soil, that means other plants can come in and continue to grow on top of this moss underlying structure, right? So that's a big key right here, that the fact that other things can come in and grow. In addition, bryophytes are a good home. They harbor nitrogen fixating cyanobacteria. So remember, nitrogen fixation is a big part of the nitrogen cycle as a whole. And if you have things that fixate nitrogen, that fix nitrogen like cyanobacteria, you're going to be able to, as a whole, your entire structure will retain nitrogen in the environment. So now we're not even talking about the soil, we're talking about the atmosphere as well. So nitrogen will be within the atmosphere so long as you have some mosses lying there sort of uh, ground at a certain place because cyanobacteria can live within moss, okay? They like to live within them. So it's sort of a, a, a give or take relationship between the cyanobacteria and the moss. Finally, the last thing of importance is to look at something known as peats, okay? So peats are going to be very broadly defined as partially decayed, so partially decayed, so dead, uh, decaying organic matter, okay? Uh, I'll say organic material. So that's what peat is just broadly referred to as, uh, partially decaying organic material. And here, um, a lot of times, the peat structure consists of something known as phagnum, okay? Consists of a something known as S-P-H-A-N-G-U-M. Phagnum is sent, essentially going to also be referred to as peat moss. So there's that moss importance. And peat moss are actually a very critical form and source of fuel. Okay? You can actually burn peat moss and get a good amount of fuel out of that uh, combustion process. So that's a very relevant idea here, that peat moss are so pervasive. They're all over the place. They're actually everywhere that you can think of where basically land presents itself. You can use that peat moss, burn it, combust it, and use it as fuel. So peat moss and sphagnum are both usually considered the same thing, just a different way of saying it. And if you burn it, and you can actually use it as a fuel source, okay? In addition, final last point, um, peat lands, which are basically areas full of peat moss, cover about 3% of the Earth's surface. 3% small number, right? But remember, most of the Earth is water. But let's say you take out all that water surface and you have just land, 3% is actually a lot. And the Earth is a pretty big place, If uh, last time I checked. So 3% uh, on, as a whole is actually a decent number. And peat lands cover about 3% of Earth's surface. And from this, what you can take away is the fact that um, as a structure, as a continuous 3% structure, they contain about 30% of all soil carbon. So they provide this basically, contain about 30% of soil carbon. So carbon elements are going to be found in soil. The reason why they're found so well in soil and other plants can sort of continue their life cycle based off of this carbon is because peatlands create a carbon reservoir. So I'll call this a carbon reservoir. And they store bunches of uh, lots and lots of carbon. And so lots and lots of carbon storage would mean that lots of other plants can continue to grow. So that's our basic importance of mosses. That covers the bryophytes. Very complicated life cycles, but the life cycles make sense when you think of their needs and wants, the moist environment, and let's say the dire sort of constraints, a dry environment. That would mean you have a gametophyte stage and a sporophyte stage, and you can alternate between them based off of the environmental cues presented, and these are, of course, the important things that you should remember about the relevancy of moss.